Noah is just one of those stories we think we all know. Everyone knows the outline of the story, but for most people, it's been such a long time since they took a good look at it and are even longer time since they thought much about it. In this video, we're going to take a look at the story and find out where the story truly comes from. Would it surprise you to learn that much of the story is heavily influenced by a story found in Babylon? It's true, much of the story in the Bible was borrowed from a much less known Babylonian story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's more than a theory and it's pretty much a fact. Not only does the biblical patriarch of Abraham come from the Mesopotamian area, which explains why the stories were included in the book of Genesis, there are also so many similarities between the stories, it's easier to only look where the two accounts differ. In this video, we'll be looking at those stories and seeing what we can discover for ourselves. Ultimately, we want to find the truth. What sort of evidence is there for a catastrophic flood? Although the story of Noah in the Bible is too long to quote, the direct Bible verses here, since it takes a full three chapters in Genesis, let us take a brief look to reacquaint ourselves with it. There are also bits and pieces about Noah to be found in the Jewish Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. This will allow us to fully see how it compares to the Book of Gilgamesh and other stories found in Mesopotamian tablets and then look for the evidence of the flood. The flood story occurs in Genesis chapter 3 through 6. Now keep in mind that the date of when Genesis was written down was sometime in the 8th to the 3rd century BCE, according to recent studies. However, to sum it up, 10 generations after Adam and Eve, the earth had grown very sinful, according to God. So he decides to essentially reverse creation with a huge flood. However, God found one man he felt was worth saving, Noah, and he instructed him to build an ark. Inside the ark, he was directed to keep pairs of animals to help repopulate the earth. After 40 days of rain, the ark came to rest upon the mountains of Ararat, where Noah built an altar, and after a sacrifice to God, they made a covenant between them. In this covenant, humans could eat meat but not drink blood, and God would never again destroy us with a flood. According to the Bible, after the flood, Noah planted a vineyard and got drunk and presumably celebration. One of the more interesting facts that is known from the Dead Sea Scrolls is that Noah's father was worried Noah was actually fathered by one of the Watchers, a type of angel which would have made him a Nephilim. Since we are seeking an actual evidence of a flood, and there are all those stories about those who came from afar and taught us everything we know, that is a tantalizing little fact. Now the stories in the Epic of Gilgamesh and other tablets are very similar to the Noah story. Let us take a look at those so we can just see how much. The Epic of Gilgamesh was written around 1800 BC. Although Gilgamesh allegedly historically rain dates to around 2700 BCE. In this epic, it's the Babylonian gods who decided to flood the earth rather than God. However, there is so much that is the same that very few people doubt it's the same story, or at least it comes from the same source. One of the very few differences is the number of days of rain. For Noah, it was 40 in the epic of Gilgamesh it's just six. Don't miss our video, Noah's Ark Found, The Controversial Discovery. One of the even earlier flood myths that was written is the Mesopotamian epic of Atrahasis. On the third tablet of this epic, it contains the story of the flood. In this version of the flood, the god Inki stands behind a reed wall and warns of the god Enlil's plan to destroy humanity with a flood. Inki further proposes that Atrahasis survive it by building what was essentially an ark. Now this story is also contained in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is why we're only looking at it once. These myths are so very similar. In fact, Noah is the 10th patriarch in the Bible and the hero of the Mesopotamian flood story, 
is the tenth antediluvian king. So clearly these myths were swirling around the area and were important enough to write down several times. Keep in mind that writing on clay tablets was no easy task too. So these stories were important to them. Well, why were they so important? One thing they emphasized as we looked at what was different to God or the gods. However, could it have also been an attempt to remember a disaster that humans barely remembered? Keep in mind, worldwide there are these myths. There are so many you can hardly count them. So it's something that many people and cultures believed happened. In almost all of them, the flood was sent by the gods to destroy humanity. Also associated with these myths are the stories of people coming from away and teaching them the arts of civilization. Even in the extra canonical books of the Bible, you had the fallen angels teaching humans forbidden knowledge. So this idea that Noah may have been fathered by a watcher who would also have known such forbidden knowledge is quite interesting. What forbidden knowledge would she have learned from her watcher lover and pass on to her son if it was true? Although it's fun to speculate unless archaeologists find a tablet or scroll saying, I am Noah and here is my life story, it will have to remain as a speculation. It is far more interesting to set Noah in a broader context which sets him as a heavily borrowed from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now the Epic of Gilgamesh is clearly much older than Genesis. The stories may date from the same time, but they were written down much later and then changed to fit the religious faith with their particular focuses. Now as we saw, the reasons for the flood set forth in the stories are very different. One is that humanity is utterly sinful and unredeemable, and the other, we're merely annoying the gods. One explanation for this is the dating since humanity had progressed in the thousands of years between them. The emphasis changed from solely following the gods, will to also being a morally upright person in the air. So that explains the shifting focus. But what about the actual flood? Is there any evidence for an actual flood? Floods during the last glacial period did happen periodically. Now what else do we know that dates to around them? The temples found at Turkey, Gobekli, and Karahan Tepe, there could be a link there. However, there are a few theories that are even more enticing theories we should look at. Sharupik is one Mesopotamian city that was held by the kingly version of Noah, and they had a flood layer found when it was dug up at the dates to 2900 BCE. The geography of the Mesopotamian area changed substantially when the sea levels rose after the end of the last glacial period. As we have stated in previous videos, during the last glacial period, there was a significant more land available to settle that was rapidly filled with water. This area is much larger than you may think. The estimates of the size of that area show in Mesopotamia along were several hundred kilometers more land. The areas above the current water level were rapidly settled around 5500 BCE. More exciting even still comes from the work of archaeologist Bruce Mass. He has postulated that there was an oceanic asteroid impact on the Indian Ocean during a solar eclipse. This impact would have caused a tsunami. According to him, these points to 2807 BCE, which would be backed up by the flood layer found at Sharopik. It's like an onion with endless layers. In the end, we may never be entirely sure what caused the flood myths. There are plenty of floods to pick from. Maybe they all coalesced and are remembered as one. It would seem that the end of the last glacial was a strong candidate considering the global nature of the flood myth. What seems clear is that the flood that inspired these stories was vast enough and important enough that they were remembered not just remembered, but kept alive in some of the earliest literature humans wrote. For that reason alone, we should take a careful look at what they have to teach us about the past. In a world consumed by iniquity, Noah was chosen by God to build a giant ark to save the earth's creatures from the flood that was soon to come. For years he toils, forging and sowing, while the taunts and threats of his neighbors echo around him. 
But Noah knew that his mission was predetermined by God, and he continued to work, trusting in God's guidance and protection. At last, the day came when the rains began to fall and the waters rose to engulf the earth. Noah and his family, along with the animals he had gathered, huddled in the ark and waited for the waters to recede. When the ark finally came to rest on Mount Ararat, Noah came out, blinking in the bright sunlight, to survive the new world that he had been born from, the destruction. More than once, archaeologists and scientists have been skeptical of the locations mentioned in the Bible. Many times, however, they end up finding what they're looking for exactly where it is listed in the ancient book. Where is Noah's Ark today? How many researchers have searched for it over the years? What did they find on Mount Ararat? These are just some of the questions we will be seeking answers to in this video. The Story of Noah and His Ark Noah was a good and righteous man who loved the Lord with all his heart and soul. One day God spoke to Noah and told him that he would send a great flood to destroy the earth, but that he and his family would be saved if they built an ark and gathered two of every kind of animal on earth. Building the vessel was not an easy undertaking, especially in those days when there was no electricity and no power tools. But Noah was determined to do what God commanded him to do so, so he set to work, forging, cutting, and shaping the wood with his own hands. For many years, he worked tirelessly on the ark, even when the people around him mocked him and thought he was crazy. However, he did not care about the opinions of others because he knew that he was doing the right thing by following God's will. And so he continued to build day after day until finally the ark was completed. When the day of the flood came, Noah and his family gathered in the ark, waiting for the storm to pass. For 40 days and 40 nights, the rain continued to pour, and the world became a vast ocean. Then the rain stopped, as suddenly as it came. The waters began to recede, and the ark rested on Mount Ararat. We find confirmation of this in the Bible. Genesis chapter 8, verses 3-6. through six. Little by little, the waters receded from the earth, and after 150 days, the waters began to recede. And on the seventh day of the seventh month, the ark rested on the mountains of Arat. The waters receded continually until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains appeared. Then, after 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he made. When God tells them Noah and his family leave the ark to explore the new world they had been born from the destruction. After looking around, they see that everything is different now. The world is fresh, new, and full of possibilities. As they look toward the horizon, they realize they've been given a second chance, a chance to start over and make amends. Undoubtedly, the story of Noah is perhaps one of the most outstanding biblical narratives. Most of us are used to accepting these parables as pleasant and instructive stories with mythological value. But is it possible that this story has left physical evidence and has been found for other places, events, and objects mentioned in the Bible? Where does Noah's Ark lie today? This question was asked long before we asked it in this video. Specifically, the first recorded expedition to search for Noah's Ark was conducted in 1829 and was led by a Frenchman named Félix Bonjour. He and his team climbed Mount Ararat in Turkey, but failed to find any trace of the Ark. Since then, numerous expeditions have been organized in an attempt to find the Ark. The biggest development related to the search for the physical remains of the biblical artifact was announced by a group of researchers from the Christian organization Noah's Ark Ministries International. They announced they have discovered the remains of the Ark, which they believe is buried under the snow and volcanic debris of Mount Ararat in Turkey. However, this claim has been met with skepticism because archaeologists and historians who have noted that no previous expedition to find the physical remains of the Ark has been successful. Now is the time to remind you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Paul Zeminski, an archaeologist at Stony Brook University, says he knows of no previous expedition that has searched for the Ark and actually found it. 
The latest discovery claim was made by a Turkish and Chinese researchers who are part of the international group Noah's Ark Ministries and who announced their findings in Hong Kong, where the group is based. Although the researchers stated they believe there is a 99.9% .9 probability that the remains they found are from Noah's Ark, there is no conclusive evidence to support this claim. However, according to the research group, in 2007 and 2008, they discovered seven large wooden chambers buried near the summit of Mount Ararat at an altitude of 13,000 feet, 4,000 meters, above sea level. In October 2009, they returned to the site with the film crew to document their findings. The group claims that this discovery matches the final resting place of Noah's Ark, according to the Bible. Man Fei Yun, who is a member of the team, stated that the wooden structure they entered was divided into different spaces that was the same one mentioned in the historical accounts. The team claims that the radiocarbon dating of the wood taken from the top secret discovery site shows that the Ark is approximately 4,800 years old, which coincides with the time of Noah's flood, as suggested in the Bible. It should be noted that the claim has been met with skepticism and has not been verified by independent sources. In general, claims about the discovery have been met with a great deal of skepticism. Even scholar Todd Wood, who interprets the Bible literally, is skeptical. Wood is the director of the Center for the Study of Origins at Bryan College in Tennessee, which takes a creationist approach to biology. According to him, if the young earth chronology is accepted, the radiocarbon dating in which the radiostotope carbon-14 is measured to determine the age of organic objects must be reinterpreted. Wood believes that the radiocarbon dates need to be recalibrated. He also believes that Noah's Ark will never be found. His theory suggests that the Ark was probably used for building materials after the flood. Wood notes that if you had just stepped off the Ark and there were no trees around, you would probably use the huge boat made of wood as a building material for a new home. Therefore, he believes that the Ark was probably dismantled and used as building materials. Scientists defend their skepticism on the subject by citing several reasons. First of all, according to Jack Sassoon, professor of Jewish and Biblical Studies at Vanderbilt University, the identification of Mount Ararat with Uratu, an ancient kingdom named Ararat in eastern Turkey, did not come until later. Also, there's no geological evidence of a massive flood in Turkey about 4,000 years ago. Paul Zeminski, an archaeologist at Stony Brook University, agrees that Noah's Ark International Ministry researchers are not following the archaeological, historical, and geological data. In fact, according to Zeminski, they play a completely different ball game than the others. The archaeologist goes on to suggest that this may be a shrine erected by the early Christians in honor of the belief in the site of Noah's Ark. In this hypothetical case, however, it would not be 4,000 years old, since the Bible was not yet written during that period. Biblical scholar Jack Sassoon believes that the biblical authors intended the story of Noah's Ark to be an allegory rather than a historical account. The story was used to present a scenario in which mankind was punished for its wickedness, drawing attention to the idea of a benevolent God who expects mankind to be righteous. As if for now, the not-so-secret location of the Darupinar boat shape Noah's Ark discovered on September 11, 1959, by Turkish Army Captain Ilhan Durupinar paves the way for a far greater possibility of the ancient artifact's true location. It is believed that the remains of the actual Noah's Ark are buried in this boat-shaped formation. Major research and interest in the site began in the 1970s to the mid-1990s. American researcher Ron Wyatt and others, including Turkish scientists, are working on the site. And in 2014, and again in 2019, additional independent private geophysical surveys of the Ark Formation were done, which showed layers and interesting angular structures underground. The new GPR data shows parallel lines and angular structures at depths of 2.5 meters, 8 feet, to 6 meters, 20 feet. These parallel lines and right angles below the surface are something we should not see in natural or geological information. Interestingly, 
the fact that the formation of the boat is the exact dimensions of the ark mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapter 6 verse 15 is also confirmed. And thus you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, and its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. In the fall of 2021, a Turkish scientific team with American media, including the History Channel, began the most complete geophysical survey and scientific investigation of this site to date, using as many modern methods as possible. Unfortunately, scientific research will mainly focus on how to best preserve the object for future generations, which suggests that we will hardly know what lies beneath this formation at any time soon. Although there have been many expeditions and claims of discovery, the truth remains elusive to this day. Perhaps, after all, the charm of the story lies not in the physical existence of the Ark, but in the deeper meaning behind it. The story of Noah and his Ark is a symbol of hope in the face of adversity, of perseverance amid chaos, and of the power of faith in the face of doubt. Regardless of whether the Ark is ever found, this story continues to encourage us to strive for something greater, to believe in something beyond ourselves, and to never lose hope in the face of adversity. May we continue to be captivated by the mysteries of the world around us. Subscribe to our channel because we don't want to stop exploring the unknown.